everybody, and welcome to DryDock episode 40. Just a few minor bits of channel admin. I've added a couple of details, uh, e the email and link to SpringSharp on the competition uh, announcement video. Uh, sorry for omitting those details at first. And uh, other than that, at the point that you're listening to this, all being well, and assuming there hasn't been some horrific air accident over Europe, I shall be somewhere in Hungary, where I'll be trying to track down a rather interesting little museum ship for you all to have a look at next week. All things being well, we should see that on the channel. So anyway, uh, with that said, on with questions. So the two videos we're picking highlighted questions from today are the Levadia and Tirpitz videos. So let's start with the Levadia video. The sources for this are the, well, believe it or not, the New York Times, which did a whole load of different articles on the ship at the time that the ship was around. And the other major source outside of, say, random little articles found here and there is the rather wonderfully titled Modern History of Warships, comprising a discussion of the present standpoint and recent war experiences for the use of students of naval construction, naval constructors, naval officers, and others interested in naval matters. And as you might guess, that is not a recent publication. That was published back in 1920. Ah, don't you love the old book titles? Anyway, so with that said, let's go on with the actual questions from that video, shall we? So, Cobra51 asks, how often were ships' secondary batteries used in battle, and how effective were they? The answer is actually surprisingly often, uh, believe it or not, although the idea of the secondary battery being a decisive uh, battle-winning weapon went away with the advent of the Dreadnought, the fact is that for all the hypothetical talk that went on both the late World War One through the interwar period and even into World War Two, about extreme long-range fire, deck penetration, etc., etc. The simple fact of the matter is that physics doesn't allow you to be spectacularly accurate at those kind of ranges, even with the best fire control computers in the world. And so, although some battles did involve long-range hits with the main armament, practically every naval engagement you see both in World War One and into World War Two, even if it starts at long range, will involve one side or the other desperately trying to shorten the range in order to, depending on who they are, either further execute their opponent or to try and actually get some hits in in the first place. So, so as the range closes, although the battle might open with main battery salvos only, secondary battery salvos start to come in eventually in almost all major uh, naval actions. Obviously, um, the, the Battle of Samar, the, the single five-inch gun that made up the the secondary... Well, I guess maybe it might have been even the primary battery of an escort carrier. Depends if you count aircraft as the primary battery or not. Um, obviously was used, but... Um, I mean, even in that battle, also the, the Yamato six-inch secondaries were used. At the Battle of the Denmark Strait, Prince of Wales's 5.25-inch guns exchanged fire with uh, Bismarck and Prince Eugen's secondary batteries, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, obviously, at something like Surigao Strait, that's dead close range, so secondary batteries, especially on the Japanese side, were going off left, right, and center. So, yeah, they were... Right up until the end of battleship gun duels, they were used more often than not, certainly. Um, at the Battle of Jutland, both sides blazed away without much effect with vast numbers of their secondary weapons. In terms of effectiveness, mm, well, as, yeah, th there was a reason for the, for the Dreadnought concept. They had a certain degree of effect in the pre-Dreadnought era. Battles like um, Manila Bay the and... Uh, the Battle of Cuba and uh, in the Spanish-American War, obviously the Battle of Tsushima, things like that, um, and the various uh, battles between the Ottoman and Greek navies, the secondary batteries did have something of a role to play um, in terms of effectiveness, but even then their effect was somewhat lessened in most cases compared to what people thought they might be able to do. Um, and once you get into World War One and World War Two their primary effectiveness is actually, well, as designed at that point, to be used uh, 
in taking out or uh, driving off destroyers and small ships like that rather than um, doing direct damage to the other capital ships although in theory obviously that could happen because a six inch shell or a 5.25 inch shell or whatever is equally as capable as knocking out a radar as a heavy capital ship shell so yeah how effective they were depends on what use you're putting them to obviously um, five inch 38 secondary battery is very effective in battle when you're shooting against aircraft because um, although they did invent a few large caliber anti-aircraft shells they're not so effective as you might want Andreas Tiefenthaler, I think, um, says, how would the design of the Popovs, that's the round Russian ships, be changed to be more successful? I think the single, the single best change they could have made would have been to take more detailed models of the ships over to William Froud's tank at Haslar as early as possible. Uh, because a lot of the failings of the ship involved their propulsion and steering, um, as I mentioned in the video on them, to the point that they 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 could take off two of the engines and propeller shafts of the six and have absolutely zero effect on the ship's actual capability, and the rudder also was mostly a bit of dead weight. So, yeah, if they if they consulted with him earlier, they could have made some changes to the hydrodynamics of the ship that would have probably improved its speed and uh, reduced the amount of investment they had to make in engines, propulsion, rudder, etc. Um, get them working a bit better. The, I mean, overall, they're not spectacularly bad ships. So that probably would be the main improvement. The other thing is that of any kind of ship, obviously you have the square cube law um, going on where you can double uh, ship's dimensions, you increase its volume by a factor of eight, and with these uh, round or near round vessels, that they are one of the ones that are most well placed to take advantage of that. So if you look at Popov's original designs, the ones that were far too large for the Russians to afford, just building them larger probably would have helped as well, because you, they you would have got a vast, vast increase in surface deck area, and therefore you could have had a lot more guns um, for a relatively minimal increase in armour. No idea if they would have gotten any faster, particularly, without the aforementioned hydrodynamic modelling, but um, they certainly would have been a lot heavier and nastier combatants. Pal BR asks, which would win, a squadron of Fletcher-class destroyers or a squadron of Tribal-class destroyers? Now, that's a little bit of an interesting one, because... Unlike a lot of the opponents that the Fletchers face, the Tribals are going to be just as well crewed. Um, and by the time the Fletchers are rocking out with modern fire control and radar systems, so were the surviving Tribals. Um, so it's <clears throat> a lot of the advantages that the Fletchers had over their historical opponents don't so much apply here. The Fletcher, the 5 inch 38s on the Fletchers are faster tracking and slightly faster firing than the 4.7s on the Tribals, but the Fletchers have five of them, the Tribals have eight. Um, so overall total rate of fire is still actually in the Tribals' favour, thanks to those three extra barrels and the fact that their rate of fire isn't tremendously far behind uh, the American guns. So in a straight-up gunfight, I have to give it to the Tribals purely on the basis of it's pretty much a coin toss over, um, as I said, accuracy and, and sensor systems. So it would basically come down to who's going to hit first and with an overall rate of fire more shells in the air advantage thanks to their more numerous guns, the tribals are going to come out of that on top statistically most of the time. However, there is a balancing factor in that even in destroyer engagements at high speed with a lot of frantic turning and manoeuvring because of their close range, destroyers on all sides did fall victim to torpedo strikes. And the tribals do have torpedoes. They have a single, um, single launcher, whereas the Fletchers have two launchers. So... The Fletchers have more torpedoes than the Tribals, which means they have more chances of letting a torpedo out that will actually score a direct hit and possibly take a Tribal out of the get equation entirely. So I think it, the one thing obviously with that is that it is a little bit of a, uh, a luck factor 
um, more than anything else because uh, well the kind of ranges that we're talking about the torpedo launchers are probably going to be spotted and the more destroyers are present the more likely it is for them to for them to be spotted so yeah i w i would say the tribal class squadron does have an advantage pretty much as they were designed to do they were designed to gun down pretty much any destroyers they came across however the caveat to that being that although, although i'm giving the tribals the edge it's entirely possible that the Fletcher Squadron may get one or two lucky torpedo strikes that might switch the game around entirely, bearing in mind that, as I said before, quantity has a quality all of its own, and if you're talking about a squadron of Fletchers, that's an awful lot of torpedoes if they choose to dump them all at once to try and ensure that you cannot, in fact, dodge this. And lastly for this section, Sabre 6 asks, Several World War II ships had three of their main armament turrets in the front of the superstructure, like the Nelsons, Brooklyns, Takaos, Miyokos, and Megamis, uh, but whilst they all had forward turrets in with one superfiring and two at main deck, why did the Brooklyns, Takaos, and Miyokos have their third turret facing aft, while Nelson's third turret faced forward, and Megami put its two forwardmost turrets at deck level? In large part, although it doesn't necessarily apply to all cruisers of this layout, but it does apply to most, um, it was to do with the ability to protect the ship. Obviously, having a turret facing backwards when your other two are facing forwards is not ideal from a turret training perspective, as it means that the rear turret needs to swing out a lot, swing around a lot further from rest position, and if you are then tracking targets across your bow, either because you're turning or your target's passing you, your third turret probably won't be engaged for quite a while, if it's the one that's facing backwards. But anyway, <coughs> um, part, so, but with the cruiser, it's turret rate of traverse is generally obviously better than a battleship, although again, not in all cases. Um, but the the idea is that if you place a your middle turret super firing over your front turret, the two barbettes are fairly close together. Now, if you lay them out Nelson style, where the third turret is also then facing forward, then the barbette between your second and third turrets are separated by the length of your turret's guns plus a bit. Whereas if you put them back to back, the barbettes are separated by effectively whatever clearance you need for the back of your third turret. So they're a lot closer together. And when you're talking about cruisers where they quite often would have variable thicknesses of main belt and try and put uh, significantly more thickness over the magazines for obvious reasons where they could, although again, not in all cruisers, um, then this is kind of why that layout makes sense. Um, and yes, it's, it's basically trying to group barbettes closer together so that you can have increased thickness of protection over your machinery, or in this case magazines, um, without having to extend that thicker and therefore heavier section of belt further than you absolutely need to, which means you can put weight into other useful things. Now, the reason for the Nelson's layout was basically because, well, it's a battleship, it needs, uh, with the turret turning slower, it needs to be able to keep all its turrets bearing at once. And also the belt is kind of a uniform thickness on a battleship, or on most battleships, the belt, the main belt is a uniform thickness from front to end. Um, they, some battleships will vary and have slightly thicker over magazines and machinery, sim similar to cruisers, but most of the time it is a uniform thickness once you look at the main uh, armour belt strake. And so, yeah, that's with Nelson. It was a case of the mechanics of keeping guns on target were more important than concentrating the barbettes. And so we come on to the Tirpitz video. The sources for this were primarily uh, Doolin and Gartsky's rather excellent Axis uh, battleships of World War II. And the other source was uh, also the rather excellent Target Tirpitz, which is a, a very good read. And uh, <laughs> you have to scale both of those in excruciating detail to get the numbers, exact numbers for um, the various raids because, well, they're available online and such, but it always serves to check first rather than just go running off with whatever you happen to find um, scattered about the internet. Anyway, on with questions.
So Lexington476 asks, were they able to rescue any of the crew after the Tirpitz capsized? Yes, they were able to rescue some. Um, a number of sources I've read give slightly different figures, but the most common one I've seen is 82. Um, some say 78, others say 86. I have no idea why. Um, but those are outliers. I say mo most commonly I see 80 or 82, something in that region given. And the reason why they were able to rescue those crew is generally accepted to be that they were able to cut through the lower hull plates because the ship had turned over. Um, but the reason they weren't able to rescue many more than that was actually, in ironically enough, Tirpitz's own defences working against them. So where because the ship had completely capsized, um, where they could get access to the absolute bottom hull plates, it was not an easy task, but it was still possible um, to get through in time to rescue the men before they ran out of air or flooding got to them. <clears throat> but in compartments that were closer to what had been the ship's port and starboard sides, um, mostly port, um, obviously they then started having to encounter things like the torpedo defense system. Um, which increased the depth of stuff they had to cut through a lot more, and so they weren't able to cut through those sections in time and had to concentrate their efforts on where they could actually reach people before, as I say, they ran out of air or water came in. Josh Thomas Moore asks, What do you think of the scattering of PQ-17 and the reasons not to reform it after they found out Tirpitz was not out? So, the scatter order... I can understand why they did it, because the last thing they you would want would be Tirpitz and Battle Group to come across the convoy all in one. On the other hand, they did have the ships around to deal with that eventuality, and the order, I think, was given far too prematurely. They should have established where Tirpitz was in relation to the convoy. They had air support, they could have done that. Um, they should have worked that out first, worked out how they could manage the far and distant escorting forces and whether or not an engagement was therefore likely before the ship came across the convoy or if indeed the ship was going to come across the convoy and then made the decision to whether or not they were going to scatter it um unfortunately they didn't they jumped the gun a bit and a lot of people paid for that um as far as not reforming it once they found turpits was not actually um around anymore um that part, I think, is more understandable and a little bit more justifiable. Because at this point, um, there had been so much radio traffic and panic and everything, the Germans knew exactly what was going on, or near enough, uh, as far as the convoy was concerned. Um, and U-boats and Luftwaffe aircraft were homing in like a pack of wolves. Um, it would have been a lot more difficult to reform the convoy because with the convoy scattering for, to the four winds they would have had to announce some kind of rendezvous position and a smart u-boat captain may or may or looked off a pilot may well have um tailed a ship to if they noticed it wasn't on direct course for the soviet harbors they may have tailed a ship and then noticed well hang on a minute why is this ship or and or multiple ships um, I need to put that on silent. Um, why are they tracking in on us? And uh, sorry, why are they sort of all assembling in this area? And why are they why are there multiple ships tracking in and all standing waiting basically whilst everyone else assembles? That would have been a massive sitting duck. Um, and obviously with the escorts out trying to both find incoming ships, uh, friendly and hostile. It it would have delayed the convoy massively, and it possibly would have set them up like a shooting gallery for a mass attack by U-boats and Luftwaffe aircraft, so I can understand why they didn't really go for a reformation afterwards. Michael Jones asks, Although Tirpitz never really fought the kind of battle she was designed for, she tied down a lot of Allied resources. Would keeping Bismarck in Norway have increased this effect, or was fear of Tirpitz caused by the success that Bismarck had? And secondly, was the Allied effort to contain dis dash destroy Tirpitz justified, given that by 1944 what could she really achieve in the face of Allied air power? <sighs> 
Well, in answer to the latter question, the deployment of Tirpitz to Norway, whether intentionally or unintentionally, did actually obviate a significant portion of Allied air power. As mentioned in the video, a number of strikes on Bismarck were terminated due to poor weather, and even when Bismarck was occasionally found at sea, airstrikes did have some issues, shall we say, with trying to actually catch up with the ship um, in particularly foul weather. Basically, with the fact that so far north especially during the winter months night can last for a very long time and the weather is often exceptionally foul both in terms of incredibly high winds and also fog snowstorms rain etc i mean even today it's not the nicest environment to operate in with an aircraft but especially in world war ii that combination of environmental factors could actually blunt the effectiveness of Allied air power quite significantly, so relying on being able to airstrike Tirpitz if it ever came out wouldn't have been a safe bet, I don't think. it's. I mean, especially if the Germans, obviously knowing the Allies had lots of air power, timed their breakout for a period of poor weather. Um, so, yes, in, in a way, the effort to contain and destroy the ship was justified on that basis relative to air power but also on the basis that if Tirpitz got out and it did manage to find a convoy either um, avoiding the distant escort or coming just coming across a convoy where they hadn't put a particularly heavy escort on it um, the amount of damage that Bismarck could cause both in morale terms lost ships and sheer financial cost would have been way out of proportion to any resources the Germans had spent on her up till that point. Um, it, it's kind of that that maxim that one side has to get lucky all the time, the other side only has to get lucky once, and Tirpitz would only have needed to get lucky once and get into one convoy for it to be a complete and utter disaster, especially since the Allies, by the latter part of the Second World War, had not resources to spare, but they certainly had a few um, additional resources they could devote to the area. And bear in mind, it's not just Tirpitz until, well, it's just Scharnhorst is there for a while. Once Scharnhorst goes down, there's still other Kriegsmarine vessels there, so it's not just Tirpitz alone. Um, and as far as um, why the Allies devoted so many resources, well, as I said, partly it's because there was a significant portion of the Kriegsmarine's active fleet in Norway. Um, Yes, Bismarck's uh, run into the Atlantic probably did have an effect on the numbers of ships devoted uh, to the area, but then again, it's also just simple good practice to devote extra firepower. Um, retaining Bismarck in Norway along with Tirpitz, it, it would have increased the effect slightly because you would have wanted uh, enough ships to have a margin of victory over two battleships rather than one, but I don't think it would have had as great an effect as Tirpitz on its own had re in relative proportion because if Tirpitz is there, you need to tie down two battleships at least, so you're looking at a minimum twice the sort of uh, fleet commitment as opposed to what the Germans have there. If Bismarck is present, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go up to four battleships. You might they might well settle at three, with uh, sort of lots of destroyers. So, um, keeping Bismarck in Norway would have increased the number of resources the Allies had to devote to keeping them bottled up. But I don't necessarily think it would have um, doubled or more the number of resources they committed. And lastly for this section for this week, uh, Ki Yong Jang asks, Was there any battleship in history capable of surviving a tall boy strike? If not, what about paper battleships? It's an interesting question, actually. A single tall boy strike? Arguably the Tirpitz did. Um, it got hit by it, and then obviously got moved and then got hit again several times. Um... Weirdly enough, when it comes to use against uh, capital ships, as actually the bombing of the Tirpitz proved in several parts, the Toolboy, somewhat like the Fritz X actually, often proved to be just a little bit too effective. Um, if you look at, say, the Fritz X that hit Warspite, it just went straight through the ship out the bottom and exploded underwater, which actually therefore did a lot less damage than it would have done if it exploded inside the ship. And similarly with Tirpitz, uh, 
at least one tall boy, possibly more, that hit her just went straight through like a knife through butter. Um, unfortunately for uh, Turpitz, the tall boy carried significantly more explosive than a Frittex, so even having it detonate nearby didn't help matters very much. Um, so yeah, ironically, I think battleships capable of surviving a tall boy strike, probably the older ones would have had a better chance. Um, so something like um, Andrew Doria, Julia Cesare, um, Revenge, or Congo, something like that. If they'd been in deep water and been hit by a tall boy, there's a relatively good chance, assuming it doesn't hit something quite heavy like a turret roof, um, there's a fairly good chance the tall boy might just punch straight through the ship and detonate deep enough under the water that, well, I mean, the ship is still going to be in major trouble but it might survive. Um, whereas in a somewhat weird turnabout of events, if you took it a tall boy and dropped it on something that actually had quite a lot of deck armor, like um, say a Yamato or an Iowa, or um, in terms of paper designs, obviously a Montana um, or uh, one of the later revisions of the Lion class, those ships might actually suffer significantly worse because the tall boy might be slowed down sufficiently punching through uh, the heavier deck armor in order for it to still be inside the ship once it detonates. And having a 12,000 pound bomb that is effectively a large flying block of incredibly powerful explosive with a out with a sort of a, a nice metallic outer casing going off inside your ship is probably going to be the end of your ship, no matter how big you are. Um, well, let's see what happened to the Turpits. I mean, the Turpits was by no means a small ship, but when that, that tall boy went off inside, it was curtains. Um, so, yeah, uh, weirdly enough, the, the smaller and lighter battleships might well have survived, or albeit they'll probably be completely wrecked by it, but they're not going to go down immediately. Um, in terms of paper battleships that might actually just survive flat out, well, there were one or two sketch designs produced at the end of the war, most notably by the Royal Navy, um, where the designs were told, well, what, just design a ship that can survive modern threats, which at that point included things like Tallboy or Grand Slam, <laughs> or a bunch of rather interesting rockets, rocket-powered bombs. Um, and they effectively they concluded that you had to, you would have to put sort of heavy battleship grade armor plating as the deck armor um so yeah the royal navy's 1944 1945 battleship um with which was a thousand feet long with with sort of 12 inch plus thick decks that might survive um but then again what would be left above deck once a tall boy had gone off don't think it's I mean, survival is not necessarily a, a, the winning prize that it sounds like at that point so hopefully that answered the question and once again just to reassure people just because i've answered questions from a particular video and not covered yours doesn't mean i won't cover yours at some point in the future it just means that in the 10 minutes or so i've allocated for that video specifically in the dry dock i wasn't able to reach your one um obviously the more general questions which we're, what we're coming on to now um we are sort of playing a long-term game of catch-up on our time Ascaron asks what do you think about italian admirals of world war ii like for example dazara campioni and fiora vanzo uh, again um feel free to correct my butchered pronunciation in the comments my opinion varies wildly from Admiral to Admiral, because they seem to be a, a very eccentric bunch of people. Um, I have a certain degree of sympathy with uh, some of them, especially the lower-ranked Admirals, um, although some of them later got promoted, um, such as Dazara. The, some of them, as I like Dazara, they seem to have been fairly competent individuals, um, they certainly handled their squadrons with uh, as much success as could be expected of them. And a lot of the time, a lot of their stories r read with the passage passages similar to, and they were poised to do XYZ operation that would have led to, well, at least a glorious battle, if not necessarily a victory. And then their orders were cancelled, or and then they were recalled. Um, so they seem to have suffered more at the attentions of high command and um, 
such like than anything else. On the other hand, some of the the higher ranking officers, um, well, the ones who started off the war higher ranking anyway, definitely seem to have been questionable choices for their positions. Um, the two in particular, or if you look at the the, the sort of the sequence of command, uh, you have Campioni, who doesn't particularly seem to have been that good at handling his fleet um a bit too cautious even though he had um statistical superiority over the royal naval forces um in the period that he was engaged with um so yeah o overly cautious uh, as an admiral not not quite aggressive enough especially given the balance of power and on the flip side he i have to give him credit for the fact that um when the Germans set up their puppet government that controlled northern Italy. He refused to cooperate with them and ended up getting shot for his troubles. Um, so he was certainly a brave officer, um, just possibly a bit too cautious when it came to actual act action. Um, his successor, on the other hand, uh, Angelo Iacchino, I've, I've got to come to the conclusion he must have been a political appointee because he does not seem to know what the hell he was up to <laughs> when it comes to uh, pursuing uh, pursuing warlike goals. Um, he's the one who's responsible for Cape Matapan because he refused to listen to uh, reports that British battleships were in the area. Um, and so, yeah, he sent a whole bunch of some of Italy's more advanced heavy cruisers to be shot up mercilessly by British 15-inch guns at night. Um, and then, having taken that disaster on board, promptly then became even more reticent about engaging the enemy than his predecessor had been. Um, basically, just he, he, again, he would come across with... Uh, come across actions where he had superiority and would just not engage. Um, or would fall back, or would pull pull his subordinates back, um, and then ended up trying to excuse himself repeatedly in text form um, after the war. So yeah, those guys I don't don't rate them much up at all. Um, but as I say, on the other hand, um, some of the lower ranked admirals, the ones who eventually came up through the chain of command through their various predecessors, um, stuffing up their commands. Those guys I have a lot more sympathy with, and they do seem to have been generally um, a slightly more tactically uh, minded and a competent bunch compared to their superiors. Just some guy, okay, asks, when calculating weight for treaty restrictions, what was to stop a nation from just lying about belt thickness? Were there observers on constructions from other nations? Which seems unlikely given what Japan pulled off. Well, generally there certainly weren't official observers, but there were always the uh, unofficial ones, um, to varying degrees of success. Now, as far as why they didn't just lie, the main thing is that although it's relatively easy to lie about the the um, thickness of your belt armour when your ship's under construction, once it's been launched, not so much, because armour makes up a huge proportion of the ship's overall displacement and other naval architects are not stupid i mean they're not going to get the figures exactly right because obviously they didn't design your warship but just based on publicly available information and appearances a competent naval architect could drop an approximate an approximation of your ship and then work out from that its displacement as a hull, and um, factor in approximate machinery, armament, etc. weights, um, based on their own experience building their own ships, and from all of that they could arrive at roughly what your overall total displacement would be, given your stated figures. But since metal weighs an awful lot, and even an inch of armour spread out over the length and area of an entire belt, armour belt, and obviously it's on both sides, that's going to add several hundred, if not several thousand tonnes to the displacement of your ship, depending on how big your ship is and how much extra thickness you're including and not telling anyone about. That's going to significantly affect where your ship sits um, 
on the water. And people will notice that, and they'll look at their calculations, and as I say, they're not going to get it exactly right, so if they, say, uh, slightly underestimate the weight of your secondary turrets, or overestimate the weight of your superstructure or something, that's the kind of weight error that might result in your ship being a few inches more or less in the water. When you're talking about lying with any significance about the thickness of your armor, that's like feet of displacement, and people are going to look at that and go, mm, my maths is not that bad, something's up. And they're very quickly home in on, okay, what, what's, the, what's the most likely culprit? And it's going to be the armor. So it's just not worth it, um, basically. Grumpy Cat asks, do you think Dabloon would make a good name for a canine? And what is the likelihood that someone out there has a dog named Dabloon? I think it's it would make a pretty good name, actually, depending on the dog. Um, the likelihood that someone's already done it, mm, fairly high. If it's anyone who's got a sense of humour even vaguely related to mine, it's probably a golden retriever, so they can say they have a golden doubloon. Ha ha ha. Uh, feel free to throw rotten fruit and eggs at your screen at the moment, if you like. Dan Darling asks, Some German sources say that Scharnhorst had chronic propulsion issues and cite several examples of this. They go on to say that the real reason for her loss was a mechanical failure in propulsion and not because of a magical hit from Duke of York. Is this sour grapes or is this a real possibility? I tend to lean a little bit more towards the sour grapes side of things. Unfortunately, there is a certain segment of people who seem utterly convinced that the only people who could sink German ships were Germans, and nobody else could possibly sink uh, German warships, regardless of any other circumstances. But anyway, um, yes, Scharnhorst Horst did have various propulsion issues throughout its life. However, um, during the actual Battle of the North Cape, when it wasn't being torpedoed and shot to pieces, uh, Scharnhorst Horst propulsion systems generally held up um, pretty well. Also, there's the fact that, obviously, Duke of York was watching the Scharnhorst very closely in order to shoot at it. <clears throat> um, we have accounts from some of the survivors, albeit there weren't that many of them. Um, and uh, between all of that, we do know that one, that one or more of Duke of York's shells hit Scharnhorst at the time that its engines went down. Um, and we know that survivors did mention they, they felt the hit, and when you reconstruct the, the mechanics of that hit from uh, the known approximate ranges and bearings of the of various ships, Scharnhorst was in a position such that a shell coming down from Duke of York's 14-inch guns could quite plausibly have punched through um, the, the upper, above the main belt, straight through the angle turtle back and into one of the engine rooms. So... Everything fits. It was in the position for such a shell to be mechanically plausible. Um, Duke of York observed a hit. Survivors on the Shan Horse reported that they were hit. And immediately after the hit, everything went to hell in one of the engine rooms and the ship started to lose speed. So putting two and two together is not exactly rocket science in that circumstance. Um, it would be actually a lot more difficult to explain why... At, the exact, at that exact moment, when the shell comes in and everyone agrees that the ship was hit, why the engines took that particular opportunity to explode. Um, it's, it seems somewhat less plausible than uh, what is generally accepted as the, as the main cause for Scharnhorst losing its propulsion systems. PadZ00 asks, uh, You often mention the Kriegsmarine ships, such as Bismarck, were often quite spacious and heavy weight given their gun calibre in comparison to Royal Navy or US Navy ships. Why was this a c the case? Were there technical limitations or just bad design or a different design approach by German authorities? Part of it was just inexperience in design um, because the... Royal US and Japanese navies, etc., well, pretty much anyone who wasn't Germany, had managed to keep at least some semblance of ship design uh, expertise alive in the aftermath of World War I, um, initially, obviously, by uh, 
designing the ships from the ni- the early 1920s, the ones that got scrapped by the Washington Treaty, and then in Britain's case by designing the Nelson class. And then during the 1920s, they were still designing destroyers and cruisers. Once the 1930s were coming up, everyone did sketch designs um, and prepared designs in case the battleship building holiday was going to come to an end. Uh, it was then extended, but they were looking. They were then spending resources and expertise um, maintaining and modernizing various battleships they already had. And then once you got into the mid 1930s, of course, they were designing and building brand new battleships. So there was a continuity of design expertise in Germany. Not so much. They were saddled with a bunch of pre-dreadnoughts until that's all they're getting. Tough luck. Um, and outside of the Emden, basically weren't allowed to design or build a thing for quite a while. Um, they started getting back on their feet with things like the Deutschland class and eventually the Scharnhorst class. But that that interval, um, ship designers need to eat just as much as anybody else. So a lot of their design expertise had gone off to other things. And that that's a very difficult bit of expertise to get back. Um, so... By the time it came to designing things like the Hippers or um, the Bismarcks, they they weren't quite up to speed the same way that the other nations were, so their design approaches were always going to be a little bit more inefficient. Um, they also had different limitations to think about. Um, with the USA especially, obviously they had to worry about the Panamax restrictions. Germany had the Kiel Canal. In the Kiel Canal, they didn't have to worry about so much about width, but they did have to worry about depth. Um, so if you need to displace a significant amount of um, water to support your ship floating, from a German design perspective, using the Kiel Canal, it is actually better to go wider than it is to go down, um, which has the side effect of making the ships relatively stable, which makes them fairly nice gun platforms in certain circumstances, not so much in others. Um, but obviously, with, with a ship still going to, need a fairly significant draft to make sure it's not completely unstable um then you end up with a, you that all combines to give you a situation where german ships end up being oversized and overweight for their firepower um compared to what what they could have got say if they'd been designed or built elsewhere and you, you see this to a certain degree with the revised designs the Germans come up with in the later uh, part of the 1930s for the Z plan, and then some of the stuff they come up with during World War II, the, the massive H projects aside. Um, they are learning, um, so their follow-on designs are sort of closing in on the efficiency of um, their foreign counterparts. So it wasn't like it was a permanent crippling thing, but for the first five to ten years of German capital ship design and basically covering most of the 1930s they were on a little bit of a, a catch-up game. Spooky Shadowhawk asks anything on Churchill's strange fetish for sacrificing battleships as instant, instant fortresses ranging from Gallipoli to saint Nazier. Well without going into too much horrific detail if we're going to stick around with Churchill and strange fetishes we could be here for a while so we won't. Um... Yeah, Churchill, very good political leader, um, but as many naval historians has ob- have observed, let him deal with the politics, keep him as far away from military operations as humanly possible in most cases. He did have the occasional good idea, um, but he was very much better at the politics than at the military part of his, uh, well, what he thought was his job anyway. Um yeah, so, uh, at Gallipoli, he, you could kind of see his point. Um, for those of you who are sort of coming into this a bit blind, Churchill had this, kept having these recurring ideas of getting an old battleship and running it ashore as if an instant fortress to um, use against the enemy. So, at Gallipoli, I can kind of see his point, um, because the by the time the Allies actually got round to going in all, all in um, the defences and the mines and everything were taking down old pre-dreadnoughts at a fairly significant clip the old pre-dreadnoughts had the armour to 
stand up to the battering of the coastal defences and they had the firepower to put the hurt on the coastal defences in return um, but they had the disadvantage of the fact they were sitting in water and could therefore sink which um, land-based fortresses are not necessarily known for generally um, so they his idea was well if we run one of them ashore yes we're never going to get it back but it can just sit there and blast away quite happily and yeah it'll probably be shot to pieces <laughs> by the end of things as an effective combat unit but hey ho um yeah they had enough pre-dreadnoughts to probably make that a semi-viable option um whether or not it would have actually been of much use um over long term overall i don't know but uh yeah he kind of took that and ran with it um yeah i don't know quite why he he seemed to have this idea repeatedly. I mean, there was the, there was a similar idea about turning the R class into massively torpedo bulged anti air fortresses and wandering around with the Balt at the Baltic, daring anybody to take pot shots at them. Um, he seemed to have a lot of interesting ideas about how to get rid of the R class. Um, and as you mentioned in your question, sending one in to Saint Nazier as kind of a gigantic thirty thousand ton kamikaze would have been interesting um i i don't think they could have really disguised themselves as a german destroyer for the early part of the approach i think the germans might have cottoned on to that um but yeah it's the the r class had much better things to be to be doing um yeah so it, it's basically it, it comes from a position i think of somebody who knows something about the military but not as much they know more than is necessarily safe for them to know but not enough to make them useful um, Churchill did serve in the military, but he did not serve in the navy. Um, so, yeah, the the, the idea. Look, it, it, I suppose from possibly from his his position as a former um, army officer, looking at it and going, "Hmm, I could really use an an instant steel leviathan with heavy armor to shrug off all but the worst firepower and loads of heavy guns and everything." Yeah, you can you can see the the kind of logic there from a, a layman's perspective but it turns out that when you actually look at naval strategy and tactics not such a good idea talon harabon asks why did the imperial japanese navy designate u511 which was a type 9c submarine as a second class submarine renaming her to ro500 well the evaluation that the japanese did of the sub did point out a couple of uh fairly significant shortcomings as compared to the Japanese fleet submarines, obviously the I insert number here series. Um, so I I guess in some ways you could say possibly because they didn't think it was as good as their own fleet submarines. Um, but on the, the, I think the, the main issue was probably more the fact that they never intended to take the sub into active service as a frontline submarine, um, which obviously a first class submarine would have, would have been uh, put in that role. Um, rather, they were supposed to take it, evaluate it, and then they ended up using it in very much second-line duties um, in and around the Japanese home islands. So knowing that that was their intended purpose for the ship, I rather suspect they named it appropriately so that there wouldn't be um, questions raised and asked as to why they had a, it was what was supposedly on paper a first-class fleet submarine pottering around in dock and around the Japanese home islands when they needed every submarine they could possibly get out on the front lines such as they were. That last question and the subsequent ones are all Discord questions, by the way. Um, forgot to mention that. Um, VV asks... In a video, you mentioned something called raking a sail ship. What is that? So raking a ship was, in the Age of Sail, a particularly devastating way of dealing damage to an enemy warship. This is due to due to two things. One is... Oh, so, sorry, just explain exactly what you're doing right before we tell you how bad it is. So raking a ship is basically getting your ship in a position such that you can fire your broadside either collectively or in a sequence into either the bow or stern of an enemy sailing ship. Um, now now that you know what it is, the reason why this is so devastating is twofold. One is that the enemy is going to have maybe two to four guns or something like that in the bow or stern chase positions. Um, so the firepower advantage is very definitely in your favour, um, even if you're a smaller ship otherwise, um, which then means you can do an awful lot more damage 
to them than they can do to you, just purely based on the number of guns you can each fire at each other. Secondly, and perhaps possibly more importantly, before the advent of the Citadel, uh, the Armoured Citadel with its closed-off bulkheads at either end, most warships were basically built to be watertight, and then with the heavier ships of the line and such, um, you would have increasing thicknesses of wooden planking on the sides, because that's where the broadsides were fired at, that's where they were fought, that's where everyone thought the firepower was going to come from. So they could absorb a certain amount of firepower, but also, if you managed to shoot through that, um, yes, there'd be a shower of splinters and a cannonball, but the absolute worst case scenario would be you could hit and damage and or kill the crew for a gun on the side that you'd shot at. And if you were exceptionally lucky, the cannonball might go on to then, again, damage a gun or kill the crew for a gun on the other side. But it was very, very unlikely. I mean, if a, a, good, a good fortunate shot broadside to broadside would maybe take out a gun and or three or four people. Um, whereas, if you're raking, um, a raking shot, they didn't have armoured bulkheads and such, bow and stern, with the exception of a very few odd ships here and there. Um, and this meant that your firepower would be much less impeded by physical barrier, especially on the sterns, which are mostly glass. <laughs> not known for its cannonball repelling properties um and so you could send an entire broadside down there and it would then travel the length of the gun deck front to back or back to front depending on which uh, which end you were raking it and this could do an awful lot more damage because a 32 pounder cannonball it hits a person is not really going to be terribly inconvenienced by that person um so if it's going down the full length of a deck, a single cannonball could wipe out a dozen or more men. Um, and the instant angle of those thickly armoured sides, well, thickly armored sides, more heavily protected sides would mean that even um, shot that was going slightly off angle had a very good chance of actually ricocheting back into the packed interior of the ship. Um, the guns are obviously in profile a lot better a lot bigger a target than they are um head on so there's more chance of you hitting a gun and either damaging or dismounting it anyway and again um ricochets of that nature you can hit multiple guns as they pinball down the ship's length so yeah you could you could knock our ship out with a single raking shot and even if you didn't it you would dismount guns and kill a lot more men than you would broadside to broadside but obviously everyone did their level best to ensure that this didn't actually occur. Um, so a good example of this actually is the Battle of Trafalgar. So um, you have two French 74s, the uh, Boucentar and the Redoutable. Boucentar is the French flagship. Um, later on during the battle, the HMS Victory gets into a broadside, point-blank broadside action with Redoutable, and basically spends most of the battle doing that. It's a first-rate, Redoutable is a third-rate, but, uh, and although Victory definitely has the upper hand, um, it basically spends the better part of the Battle of Trafalgar blasting Redoutable to splinters, um, but the ship is not out of action for a good while. Conversely, as the Victory breaks the French line, Victory unloads a single, albeit double-shotted, broadside in a raking position into the stern of Boucentar. Boucentar is almost instantly converted from a viable 74-gun ship of the line into a charnel house of the dead and dying, with over half of its 750-man crew converted from active sailors to flying meaty chunks and wounded men in the space of about 20 seconds. It's an absolutely devastating um, broadside, and it, it although Boucentar kind of tries to stay in the fight, it's basically, as far as being an, a properly effective fighting unit, it's basically out of action almost before the battle's begun. Um, and, well, I mean, the, the fact that one of the Royal Marines stuffed a keg of 
musket balls in, in on top of a 64-pounder carronade and blasted that in the form of a giant shotgun down the Bucentel's gun decks probably didn't help matters um, in that in that regard. But yeah, so that's, that's raking a ship, and that is perhaps a, the single best example of why you definitely do not want to be raked, especially by a ship that's even bigger than you are. Rolf, son of Rolf, asks... Uh, he says, in the Lissa video, you mentioned most capital ships for the next 50 years having ram bows. How does a ram bow differ from a regular bow? So a regular bow has, in the the kind of period that we're talking about, only two real concerns. One is, can any guns mounted in or above it fire forwards? Um, and to, to what degree of uh, deep declination? And more primarily, the main point of the bow is to let the ship progress smoothly and swiftly through the ocean so in this regard um the ideal shape for ships of the period is well and would eventually become the ideal shape again for later on is the clipper bow uh, so this is a bow where if you start from the bottom of the ship um from the keel the bow curves increasingly forward um to the point that it's actually got quite the overhang by the time you get up to the main deck level and ideally also has a bit of a flare because this allows the ship to cut through the waves pretty swiftly and the flare uh, means you don't get as much water over the bow as you otherwise would um, and it forces the water that you've just displaced off to your port and starboard sides and so it's very good for moving through the water um, and the problem with using that particular shape as a ram is that the forwardmost part of the ship, which is the bit that's going to come in contact with the enemy, is right up near the top. Um, so if it's going to punch a hole, it's going to punch a hole quite high in the enemy ship, which isn't really going to um, assist in sinking it. And also, obviously, uh, the higher up in the ship you go, the lighter the construction you want, unless it's an armoured section of the ship. Um, and so it's very likely that if you smash into a ship with a clipper bow, you're more likely to just crumple your own bow in very quickly. A ram bow is almost the inverse of that, because you want to avoid that circumstance if at all possible. Um, so a ram bow will extend forward of the keel. Um, it will They're generally wedge-shaped, although other shapes may also apply, um, but generally they're wedge-shaped, um, and therefore the protrusion of the ship's bow is uh, underwater, almost at the lowest point. The idea obviously being that this will this is in line with the keels as much as possible, so it gives the ship the maximum potential shock absorption without wrecking your own structure. It also means that you're going to punch into the enemy ship deep underwater, which is, at least for the period when ram bows are around, is where there's very little to no protection. You're also going to leave then a massive hole in the ship at a point where water can flood in, which is obviously very bad for a ship. And the rest of the bow, because of that whole um, issue of uh, getting your, your basically getting your face smashed in, the rest of the bow tends to arc backwards instead of forwards, um, because obviously the ship's hull curves away underwater. So by the time your ram bow smashes into the uh, enemy hull, it's possible that their the main part of their hull might be coming in contact with your own. Uh, the rest of your bow so then you you rake the bow backwards to try and avoid that circumstance um so yeah those are the main differences uh, also ram bows unintentionally function as what's called a bulbous bow which helps displace water away from the ship ahead of the ship um, that's later reinvented in the second world war um, it's a bit of an unintentional side effect but it does mean that uh, ships fitted with a ram bow as and when they start to go out of fashion in the mid 1900s are actually capable of a knot or two faster speed for the same power as successor ships that don't have this setup. And lastly for this week, Joel Fieldy asks, what would you say was the British interwar-World War II era warship with the most interesting-exciting service history? I'm looking for inspiration for a model. Well, long-time listeners will be completely unsurprised to hear me um, nominate HMS Warspite as, uh, well, yeah, pretty much one of the top tier in that particular regard. 
Um, other ships that I would say possibly might grab your interest in terms of that, the Renown, uh, HMS Renown, the battle cruiser, definitely has a fairly long and interesting and exciting service history. Um, definitely wouldn't go for the hood. I mean, it's got all, it's got a long service history. Went to a lot of interesting exotic places in the interwar period, but its wartime service um, cut short a little bit abruptly, shall we say. Um, let's see what else. Ark Royal, no. Um, again, rather short wartime history. Um, Cruiser-wise, what should we look at cruisers? Uh, uh, I mean, HMAS Sydney's a good one. Uh, albeit that's technically Australian, built in Britain, but in the Australian Navy. Most, most of the thing is, most British cruisers are either right back from First World War, in which case they were kind of second line duties by the Second World War, or they were built in the mid to late 1930s, so they don't have a particularly long or interesting interwar service history. Um, Norfolk or Suffolk, though, did get in uh, both county class cruisers. They got involved in a fair number of uh, rather important shenanigans, especially Norfolk um, during World War II. So definitely probably worth a look. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd say that probably uh, Norfolk, Renown or War Spite, if, uh, if you wanted to top three. And that brings us to the end of the Dry Dock episode. 41. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully now the SoundCloud upload should be timed in with the public release of the Dry Dock on Sundays, and I hope to see you again in another video.